I'd like to begin this episode with a brief anecdote from 2006. At the time I was working my third job at a call center, and there was this guy who used to brag about attending a Led Zeppelin concert in his youth. Because some of my co-workers knew about my Zeppelin fandom, they called me up as this dude was annoying. I asked him and he said he saw Led Zeppelin in 1974. He had a concert poster from the gig in Central Park to prove it. I smirked, knowing I spotted a pathological liar. I wasn't planning on exposing his bull to the crowd during lunch hour, but people like him are a disgrace for classic rock. So my then 19 year old self told him Led Zeppelin did not tour in 1974 and actually played Central Park in July 1969. The man laughed and tried to brush it off saying I was too young to know. I replied by saying I was a dedicated Led Zeppelin scholar that had the complete 1973 tour bootlegs on CDRs and studied their music to recreate their live versions with tribute bands. Deafening silence followed. The liar was caught. My co-worker smiled and thanked me later. 1974 was forever ingrained in everyone's minds that day. The year Led Zeppelin was off the road preparing their mighty comeback. Oh yes, and before I forget, on episode 1, I said I owned 5 copies of the album and totally forgot about my Barry Diamond copy from the 80s, so I have 6 copies of the album. 6. This is the making of Physical Graffiti. Welcome to episode 3. The music industry kept moving in March and April of 1974. Camel released their cult following hit Mirage. Grand Funk sang Locomotion on their eighth studio album Shining On. ABBA's second album celebrated winning the 1974 Eurovision contest with Waterloo, while Queen's follow up further perfected their glam rock vision. Rush's debut album with drummer John Rudsey paid homage to their unmistakable influences, like Led Zeppelin on the song Working Man. Frank Zappa's apostrophe reached number 10 on Billboard's 200 chart. King Crimson Starless and Bible Black was the second of a great trilogy of classics, while Hollies had the Hollies singing The Air That I Breathe. British film Son of Dracula was released on April 19th, starring Ringo Starr as Merlin and Harry Nilsson as Countdown. You get it? Countdown? So Countdown's band was made up of Peter Frampton, Keith Moon, Klaus Vorman, Leon Russell, and Led Zeppelin's own John Bonham who can be seen for about two seconds in the movie. Leonard Skinner's second helping was out with Sweet Home Alabama scoring big on the charts. Procol Harum's underrated Exotic Birds Fruit took listeners on a prog rock symphonic trip. West Bruce and Lang released their In Your Face Attack of the Live and Kicking album before disbanding. I love this record. It's up there with Made in Japan for me. And last but not least, Focus Hamburger Concerto was a full course meal of virtuosity. Led Zeppelin was featured on several April 1974 magazines such as Hit Parader, Musical Express, Music Scene, and Circus with Robert Plant's thoughts on stardom, religion, and fans plus a centerfold poster of the winners for 1974. Yeah, that's Robert and Jimmy next to Rick Wakeman. Cream Magazine ran a piece on the page memoirs with details on their most recent tour and plans for the future. 
Yet even the humble hamburger has moved into the computer age. And this place serves 450 people an hour. Your order is taken while you wait and then fed into the computer, which adds up the bill, works out your change and unlocks the till, all in the bat of an electronic eye. Uh, this nine-layer gastronomic indulgence is known as a Big Mac. The Zeppelin reached the top of the game and with it came the need of following their British counterparts' footsteps. It's no secret they admired the Beatles, who founded Apple Records in 1968, but they also paid attention to what the Rolling Stones were doing. And what did they do in 1970? Established their own label, Rolling Stone Records. They signed a five-album distribution deal with none other than Ahmed Ertigan on behalf of Atlantic Records. The Stones' works were handled by Atlantic subsidiary, Atco Records. All of their 1970s albums were released this way. Their catalog also included 1971's Brian Jones Presents the Pipes of Pan at Jujuka, 1972's Splendid Album Jamming with Edward, and Bill Wyman's solo album Monkey Grip from 1974. Jefferson Airplane had their own label in Grand Records, through which many airplane-related personnel stuff was released. Also, there was Deep Purple with Purple Records, and a catalog of four successful albums since 1972. So we see this business venture was a smart idea for bands who released a string of smash hits and cashed in a bigger slice of the music pie. Or should I say, custard pie. By 1974, Led Zeppelin had already delivered an almost perfect run of albums and were interested in developing other bands as well. Their mindset was musicians could spot talent much faster and of course wanted more control of their already incredibly autonomous creative process. Now in a very strange coincidence, both The Beatles and Led Zeppelin released four albums through their own labels before disbanding. They also had similar photo shoots one year before disbanding with drummers at the right, Secret Weapon Quiet Guys on the left, and the main songwriting partnership, Center. After much thought, the name Swan Song was chosen based on what somebody said about Jimmy's composition on the Physical Graffiti Sessions, quote, Oh come on, Paige, that sounds like your Swan Song. Publicist and Vice President for Swan Song Records, Danny Goldberg, was also quoted saying, Jimmy told him a swan's dying cry was one of the most beautiful sounds in the world. The Zeppelin's new label was set up in very close proximity to Earl's Court, an epicenter for fashion with lots of boutiques around. Swan Song Records was close to World's End District, where brutalist architecture high-story buildings replaced the once Victorian-style houses, just like the back cover for Led Zeppelin IV. Peter Grant tried to get Atlantic's own Phil Carson to work for them, but Ahmed Ertigan intervened and stopped it. This right here is very telling of the music business. Carson remained an Atlantic liaison for Swan Song, and attorney Stephen Weiss remained with the Zeppelin camp. British design team Hypnosis was in charge of the Swan Song logo. They looked at American artist William Rimmer and his 1869 piece by the name of Evening Fall of Day. Besides painting, William also specialized in sculpture, with thus his deep knowledge of human anatomy. Rimmer died on August 20th, 1879. Yep, the same day as Robert Plant's birth date, some 69 years later. Both Hypnosis' logo and the meaning of a swan song being a person's final performance before retirement signaled into a troubled future that no one could foresee nor predict. Swan Song's U.S. offices were located at 444 Madison Avenue in New York City, sitting in between Madison Square Garden and the infamous Drake Hotel. Two special parties were held to launch Swan Song Records into the world. First party took place a block away from the Drake Hotel at the Four Seasons Hotel. Guests included newly signed Swan Song artist Maggie Bell, Bad Company, and Ahmed Ertigan.
second launch party was hosted at Hotel Bel Air in Los Angeles, with guests Groucho Marx, Mickey Dolenz from The Monkees, and Bill Wyman from The Rolling Stones. Elvis Presley played the next day at the Forum on May 11th, and the Zeppelin entourage attended the show. To their surprise, the King himself told his band they had to be careful with their performance because Led Zeppelin was in the audience. Led Zeppelin got to meet their music idol later that evening. You can watch my video on the 1977 parallels of Elvis and Led Zeppelin for more details on this historic meeting. In other news, Peter Grant received an offer from Freddie Bannister for Led Zeppelin to headline a new British musical event by the name of Nebworth Festival. Grant turned it down, and because it was the first time for Nebworth and Led Zeppelin was off the road, it was a risky move that was left out of their business plans that year. How tables turn in 1979, right? The 1974 edition of the festival had Tim Buckley on his last UK show. Alex Harvey Band, Van Morrison with his Caledonia Soul Orchestra, generating mixed reviews. Mark II Mahavishnu Orchestra fresh off their Apocalypse album, and the Allman Brothers as headliners, which didn't sit in very well with the British rock community. Bad Company's debut album was the first ever release by Swan Song Records. It became the fourth best-selling record of 1974, behind Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young's So Far, Santana's Greatest Hits, and Elton John's Greatest Hits. With this uninspiring hypnosis design cover and traces of Led Zeppelin's big room sound, it started their label on the right foot making bank, thus reinforcing the idea of Swan Song Records' ability to cultivate other people's talents. It was definitely the mid-tempo sound 1974 needed in uncertain economic times. Bad company was good company. In other business trails, Jimmy Page finally opened his occult bookshop Equinox on June 20th, 1974. Located in London's Holland Street, it was to become a dedicated place for all things esoteric. While the business was set on paper in late 1973, Page still had to look for a location. Equinox never made a profit and ceased operations in the early 80s. July 1974 had Led Zeppelin visit Shepperton Studios for part 2 of their movie Project Odyssey, as well as additional filming sequences with Peter Grant and other participants. Roy Harper was one of the artists on Hyde's Park lineup for 1974, next to bands like Gong, The Bird's Own Roger McGinn, Kevin Ayers, and German singer Nico. Harper's ban on August 31st was quite special. Check it out. that man, Paul Rogers, and the rest of Bad Company.
Bad Company's first North American tour kicked off on June 8th, with their last show scheduled for September 10th in Boston. They were both main and supporting act for many bands, including Black Oak Arkansas, Santana, Ario Speedwagon, and plenty of shows next to Edgar Winter. This 21-day concert series had Peter Grant busy, and he managed to bring along his business partner Jimmy Page, who joined the band on stage for an encore on September 1st at Austin's Memorial Stadium and a second time on September 4th at Bad Company's Central Park show with opening act Foghat. This performance was a part of the Schaefer Music Festival. The list of performers who played here since 1967 is huge. Everybody played here, including Led Zeppelin, on July 21st, 1969, with B.B. King on the same bill. Now, the last 1974 show here was Rory Gallagher in Aerosmith on September 7th, with Rory allegedly blowing off the American rockers off stage. Back in England, a musical festival with the likes of the band, Joni Mitchell and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young was celebrated at a Wembley Stadium. Robert Plant and wife Maureen, plus Bonham's from tech Mick Hinton, were in attendance. An after-show jam took place in London, with Page and Bonham on stage. October saw Jimmy Page joining Ronnie Wood and Keith Richards for an informal jam. Now the session had Jimmy record guitar parts for the song Scarlet. It remained unreleased for almost five decades, until the Rolling Stones put it out as a bonus track for their 2020 reissue of Gold Head Soup. Swan Song held its third and last event to celebrate the Pretty Thing 7th studio album, Silk Torpedo. And yes, that's an album covered by Hypnosis. A Halloween party was held at Chislehurst Caves. These man-made tunnels were the result of mining for several centuries. As you'd think, they were used as ammunition storage on World War I and bomb shelters in 1940 with the memory of German Zeppelins over London still fresh. The caves were also used for film and television, such as Doctor Who's 1972 episode, The Mutants. Past the war, many activities were celebrated, including concerts in the 1960s by artists such as Lonnie Donegan, Gene Vincent, Eddie Cochran, David Bowie, Pink Floyd, Jimi Hendrix, The Yardbirds, and The Animals. Fun fact, portions of Iron Maiden's Can I Play With Madness video were shot here. Now, a funny case of copyright, Swang Song Records and Peter Grant try to stop the 1974 film Phantom of the Paradise from being released. Written by Brian De Palma of near future Carrie fame, the movie's plot involves a record producer by the name of Swan, thus his business carried the name of Swan Song Enterprises, and the Swan Song name being present in various scenes from the movie. The film's production team managed to delete as many references as they could, but still, some were visible on the final release in Halloween 1974. Now, the movie's plot is disturbing. We have a singer-songwriter, Winslow Leach, who's discovered by Swan, who then steals his music and frames Winslow for drug dealing. Leach escapes prison and breaks into Swan's record label. He falls into a record press machine that crushed the right half of his face and destroyed his vocal cords. Winslow then terrorizes Swan and his musicians. Swan recognizes Winslow and offers him a custom-made recording studio to make his music. A contract is signed with blood. Later in the movie, we find out Swan made a pact with the devil in 1953 in exchange for eternal youth. Just another day in the music business, right? Up two, three, four, three, Jane, how many pounds have you lost? Two, three, Seven. Half a pound more than me. The limits calorie control diet. Because you're only human. Mixing sessions for physical graffiti were some of the most extensive producer Jimmy Page had to endure. Additional recording sessions at Headley Grange were held for Kashmir on two dates. February 21st added vocals, 12-string guitar, and drum effects. And believe it or not, strings, brass, and mellotron were recorded on November 10th, 1974, which means the song remained in its standard rock and roll shape 
for almost an entire year. Past the swan song parties in May, Page sat down with engineer Keith Hardwood, whose resume at the time included Houses of the Holy, Pretty Things, Silk Torpedo, David Bowie's Diamond Dogs and live album set, plus the Rolling Stones' as It's Only Rock and Roll. Page worked long hours at his album favorite location, London's Olympic Studios, where some overdubbing took place. We can think of Jimmy adding guitar textures here and there. The Zeppelin's eight completed songs of 1974 revealed a very interesting problem. With a running time of 52 minutes and 9 seconds, it was 7 minutes too long for a single vinyl release. Many tracks were quite long and had a similar song structure, pretty much repeating the entire first half in the style of When the Levy Breaks. Far away from the progressive rock mini sweet sections of Stairway to Heaven, the song remains the same, the rain song, and no quarter. Graffiti's hard rock, big room sounding approach had another issue. A sameness in texture without the diversity of their last three albums through acoustic tracks. Making any edits to shorten the 1974 songs was impossible. The element of repetition was overused, thus the final track listing was challenging. So what could Jimmy do to solve the timing issue? One word. Outtakes. Revisiting the archive was done out of necessity. What did they have in storage at the time? I will not include the BBC session stuff, nor Hey Hey What Can I Do, as this was released as a single on November 1970. Let's take a look. You had Led Zeppelin 1 with Baby Come On Home and Sugar Mama. Led Zeppelin 2 had Lala. Led Zeppelin 3 had Poor Tom, Jennings Farm Blues, Keys to the Highway, and an acoustic piece by the name of Bronner R. Led Zeppelin 4 had Down by the Seaside, Boogie Wood Stew, and Night Flight. Houses of the Holy had Walter's Walk, Black Country Woman, Houses of the Holy, and The Rover. So why the chosen outtakes? With American Graffiti soundtrack boosting a renewed interest for retro rockabilly sounds, Down by the Seaside, Boogie Wood Stew, and Night Flight made absolute sense to make the cut. Black Country Woman had one important detail, the big room drum sound of graffiti. Houses of the Holy carried some of the Night Flight happy spirit and potent room atmosphere. The Rover's guitar riff lived in the same universe of Sick Again. This had to be in graffiti. Bronador was a fine transition piece with the right amount of acoustic power to make up for leaving Jimmy Page's swan song forever unfinished in the can. So what about the other outtakes? They sounded a bit too much like the early days of the band, and this would have been a stark contrast for the emotions and concept of their new LP. The 7 outtake running time was 27 minutes and 68 seconds almost in the same extension of an average 1973 live rendition of Days and Confused. This means the total running time for Graffiti had some 10 minutes of unused space for a double vinyl set. Now how these archive pieces were spliced in between their new songs created fan theories of the band trying to make Robert's new post-surgery vocals not as noticeable for record buyers. What's interesting about the running order is how it all shares a similar musical color that makes up for good storytelling. If you want to know the story behind the Untitled and Houses of the Holy outtakes, you can check my making of series for both albums. Here you will find details on the songs that ended up on Physical Graffiti. Zeppelin was lucky their outtakes worked like this. Releasing a double album was definitely the only way they could step up their game after a perfect and almost championship run up to 1973. Now, thanks to my dear patrons who fund my research, I found 146 double albums released in the 70s up to 1974. It is obvious most of these final sets were either reserved for live shows, greatest hits packages, or both studio and live material on the same release. So I looked for studio material only, narrowing the list down to 28 titles. Most notable releases included 1970s, Amon Duel's Yeti, Chicago 2, Miles Davis Bitches Brew, Derek and the Domino's debut, and Jesus Christ Superstar. 1971 had Amon Duel's follow-up, the severely underrated Chicago 3, Isaac Hayes' fantastic Black Moses, fusion band Madura's debut, Yoko Ono's second album Fly, and War's conceptual The Black Man's Burden. 1972 got prog with Aphrodite's Child, Wendy Carlos' Sonic Seasonings, Focus 3, Manassa's debut, the Rolling Stones' Exile on Main Street, and Todd Rundgren's Something Anything, featuring hit single, I Saw the Light. 1973 saw James Brown with a payback, Khan's Tago Mago, Humble Pie's Eat It, Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, The Who's Quadrophenia, 
and yes, as Tales from Topographic Oceans. 1974 had just two releases, in the ways of James Brown's Hell and The King's insufferable rock piece, Preservation Act 2. Now, Physical Graffiti seems to be musically and conceptually inspired by both Exile on Main Street and Jethro Tull's Living in the Past, which featured many outtakes. Physical Graffiti's iconic album cover was not made by Hypnosis, but American graphic designer Peter Corriston. His body of work at the time included Cheech and Chong, Uriah Heep, Batfinger, and Chip Taylor's This Side of the Brick River, with a glimpse of New York City in the background. Corriston found his album cover inspiration in New York City's East Village and the Lower East Side, with a history of Dutch settlers. It was called Little Germany, due to the large number of German immigrants being the third largest population outside of Berlin and Vienna. By the end of the 19th century, they left for other nearby areas, paving the way for Russian, Eastern European Jews and Italians coming into the neighborhood. By the 1950s, there was a rising Ukrainian population, as well as Latin American immigrants moving in. The area's historical multicultural diversity was pivotal in the creation of artistic movements like punk, as well as New Yorican works in literature and music. Iconic tenement buildings became an important part of American culture and iconography with its multiple apartment design. The Godfather Part II released in 1974 included several scenes shot on location there. Despite the accolades, New York City suffered a severe financial crisis as a result of the country's economic stagnation. While the construction of the World Trade Center aimed at prosper times ahead, Poverty and hardships were visible, like a physical graffiti of hopes colliding with reality. As we can see from these pictures at the time, what Peter Corston achieved with his album cover design was more than just make his client happy, but also create a timely social commentary that expressed a growing sentiment throughout cities around the world that hustled to survive. It was particularly fitting to the American landscape in the last years of Vietnam and the post-Watergate society. It was a return to shape and form, with Led Zeppelin's last touring trails in New York and their future movie project immortalizing Big Apple stories. Physical Graffiti was like a safe house. The music sounded like that building, a place of stairways and windows into the personal stories of both Houses of the Holy and the Unholy. St. Mark's Place was a street filled with history. Buildings 96 and 98 were used for the famous photograph. So where did Peter Corston get the idea for such magnificent visuals? Well, besides a 1953 issue of The New Yorker, many 60s albums including Bob Dylan and Ringo Starr's Sentimental Journey, Physical Graffiti's concept seems to be inspired by two records, 1972 War of the World's a Ghetto and 1973's Compartments by Jose Feliciano. Compartments was designed by American graphic artist Frank Mulvey, whose name can be found on many 70s recordings such as American Woman, Rocking, and The Best Off by the Guess Who. Now in order to achieve a square shaped cover, Corriston removed the fourth floor of buildings 96 and 98 and took it from there. These symmetrical buildings were perfect for an album cover. Because Led Zeppelin lost the 1973 Grammy Award category for Best Packaging, I think they spared no expense with graffiti. Their last album was a struggle to get their printing colors right and its gatefold wasn't much of an experience. Things were done in advance this time. Graffiti had two inner covers for each vinyl, with small pictures on the windows. These were wrapped up by a middle white insert featuring the track listing, plus different letters on the windows. The outer cover was brilliant, featuring an expensive die-cut window design, which revealed the album's title. Fans could also switch this by putting the white insert in between both vinyl records. Thus, the cover would feature small images on the windows instead. A one-of-a-kind design that would impress record buyers in 1975. Graffiti's packaging was done in collaboration with designer Mike Dowd, whose works include both Pilot and Ron Wood's debut albums. This is a small summary of the images I was able to identify from all 34 snapshots on Graffiti. <laughs>
As we all know, the front doorway of the 96 building was used for the Rolling Stones' video for their single Waiting on a Friend of their 1981 album Tattoo You, a very special moment of the Stones paying homage to a Led Zeppelin album cover. Just as a fun fact, personnel on Waiting on a Friend included Nicky Hopkins on piano, Sonny Rollins on tenor saxophone, and the legendary percussion player from Santana, Michael Carabello, on guido, claves, cabasa, and congas. Now, Led Zeppelin was nominated for Best Packaging for the third time on the 1976 Grammy Awards. They were up against the Eagles one of these nights, Carly Simons playing Possum, Phineas Newborn Jr.'s solo piano, Pointer Sisters stepping, Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here, Rod Stewart's Atlantic Crossing, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band's Dream, and Ohio Players' Honey. So who took the Grammy Award home? It was the Ohio Players and I question the Recording Academy's parameters for this award. Physical Graffiti had the best album cover, shame on you Grammy Awards. Zeppelin had no luck with the Academy, losing the 1977 edition with Presence and 1980 with In Through the Outdoor. Stay tuned for episode 4 and last part of the Physical Graffiti series, in which we will revisit their preparations and musical snapshots from their 10th North American tour of 1975. Thank you my dear patrons and PayPal supporters for keeping this channel alive. You keep this research and documentary facility going. As for the rest, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. Also you can share this on your social media platforms as it helps the algorithm. It's very much appreciated. Until the next time, bye bye.